Miss Melissa McMero. Thank you very much for coming out to the boxingbar.com and welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. And Melissa, uh, let's get a little background on you. Where were you born and raised? I was born in San Jose, California. And what was it like being uh, born and raised uh, out of San Jose, California? Um, it was cool. I don't know. I mean, it's really suburban there, so there's not much going on. But, you know, it's close to San Francisco and other places, so like you can find stuff <laughs> if you go look. So it was cool. Uh, how would you describe your childhood there in uh, San Jose? I had a good childhood. You know, my parents were really supportive, and they're still together, and they still live in San Jose. But um, they're really supportive of me and everything I want to do. And even when I started boxing, um, they were really supportive about it. And I didn't have a tough, really tough upbringing. I thought I had a normal upbringing. <laughs> so, yeah. Then I guess the big question is, how did boxing fall into your life? How did it fall into your lap? How did this happen? Um, I, You know, I just kind of, you know, was hanging out in... In Oakland, and I met up with some people, and they were going to a sparring event, and so they were like, you should come with us, and I thought, well, I guess. <laughs> so I went, and um, as soon as I got there, though, I, I was like, I would win if I got in there, so I decided I was going to sign up. And so going into the lift of the gym, or going into that day uh, in particular, you know, I mean, what attracted you to come back the next day and keep coming back after that? What did you see that drew you into the sport? Well, so at the the first one I went to, it wasn't really like a sanctioned thing. It wasn't a gym or anything. It was just a bunch of people that would sign up to fight each other. <laughs> and so, I, you know, after that, then I thought, oh, you know, I should go to a boxing gym because it's a good workout. And, and I just was like, I've always been a good athlete, and I was confident in my abilities to, like, be better than somebody else. Like, I never went in there and I'm like, oh, like, I don't know if I can do this or anything like that. So I really liked that feeling. And I went in there and I was like, okay, you know, I can win, you know. <laughs> and so, I don't know, I just thought, well, I'll just do this until I feel like I won't win anymore, you know, but it hasn't happened. So. But there must have been something that, you know, kind of sparked that little something inside you to do something like, you know, the sport of boxing. What motivated you to really thrive, to do, or to make something big out of yourself yeah. in a sport like well, boxing? Yeah, I think, you know, when I first came in, it was like a, just like a, I want to, you know, participate in this. But I think, you know, the more that I stay involved in boxing, um, the thing that really drives me is that I, I'm, like, really passionate about, like, you know, what women can do in the world. And I just, like... When I feel like I've been, like, a really good example to young girls, and, you know, I'll go and spar with a lot of young kids and and show up at different sparring events because I feel like it's a good thing to be a, a role model for somebody. And, like, women don't have a lot of role models that are other women. Like, when you look at, like, people that are doing big things, there's a lot of men out there, and it's just, like... It's, when you don't see someone that looks like you doing something, like, you just kind of don't really see it as an option as much. So that's been something for me, like, there's been a lot of times in my life where I didn't get to do something or I wasn't allowed to do something or because I was a girl. <laughs> and so I just feel like it, that hit, kind of hits close to home for me and it kind of what's kept me going in, in boxing. There's something about you that is a lot different than all the other women fighters for some reason. I mean, I remember talking to uh, to Chris Bird, who was a heavyweight uh, a champion in men's uh, at one time, and but yet he was supposed to be at the lighter weights. I mean, to be a woman fighter as it is, it's kind of hard, you know. Then you had that factor of being a woman fighter at the smaller weights, even in the men's smaller weights, it was hard to make a, a, a name. To this yeah. day, there's only like three or four names in the flyweight division in men's that yeah. made it big or made it to that $1 million status. Were all those negatives, did all that kind of drive you a little more also when you thought about it? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think it's a little bit different with women. You know, uh, I think in all the weight classes for women, it's so hard to get fights. To be honest, I think, the, I, you know, I fight a flyweight, and flyweight is the most saturated weight class. I mean, I just think that women are generally smaller than men. So there's just like, it's really hard 
to find like heavyweight women and it's like almost a little bit easier. It seems like like worldwide in the United States it's a little bit harder to find girls that like you're in the hundred and twelve pound range, but in Mexico there's a lot, in other countries there's a lot. Like in Asia, so like it, there really is like in in the entire world there's there's the most fighters are fighting at flyweight. So like that's been kinda nice. You know, I think that there's like maybe a little bit more opportunity there. Like I think you know, for the men, it's just harder to find people at that weight also. So it, it becomes, like, not as competitive of a weight class. So I, I actually think that the, the smaller size has actually been kind of nice. It's been, like, a little bit easier to, you know, find fights and things. So that hasn't bothered me. I mean, there's still, I think in all of women's boxing, there's just not a lot of us. So it's still, like, a little bit more challenging in that, you know, that way. What was it like going into this profession in an amateur career, and what was that like for you? Um, so as an amateur, I ended. Up, I had about 20 amateur fights, and I won the National Golden Gloves. I think it was 2006 or 2007, 2006. You know, I kind of ran out of, at that time, you know, the women boxing the Olympics, like, wasn't an option at all. Like, they, they had put it up to vote with the Olympic Committee, like, twice and it had been rejected twice so really like I kind of ran out of people to fight against you know I had gone to like you know all the big tournaments I went to the USA National twice and um both times I lost in the final and so there wasn't like if you didn't win the, the number one spot like there wasn't really anything for you you know so like the first year I lost you know by really small it was really close and then but after then, I couldn't find any fights. I didn't have any fights until I went to the Nationals the next year. And then by that time, I, you know, fought the same girl in the final and um, lost by a bigger margin. And then that's when I knew I said, you know, if I actually want to do something in boxing, I can't stay amateur. I can't, like, not fight anybody while, you know, the other people are traveling around the world and fighting. Because, you know, then they had Pan American Games. They had, like, things like that for the women. But... You know, only the number one girl got to go, and for everybody else, there was nothing for you. You just kind of had to, like, tough it out on your own. And at the low weight classes, you'd go to tournaments, and there'd be nobody at the tournament, and you'd spend, like, a grand or something flying out there and getting a hotel, and then you wouldn't get any fights, you know? So I just kind of decided at that point, like, either I'm going to quit or I'm going to turn pro because I just don't really have any other options. Like, it wasn't really worth it to me to train all the time to never have any fights. So that's when I decided to turn pro, and, um, you know. Absolutely, and I get that. And I, I know there's a lot of male boxers that when they're going to tell their friends or family members that they're boxers, they get a, a, a look or they get a cold shoulder, like, why would you want to do something like boxing? Yeah. And that, that's for males. Now, I, I can't even imagine what it'd be like for females. You know, what, what were people's reactions towards you when you would tell your friends or family members you saying, I, I want to be a boxer one day. What, what was that like? You know, what, what did you feel about their reactions towards that? Well, I, I kind of depended who it was. I think people that don't know me are always like, I think it's too weird, I guess. Actually, it depends. Like, most females think it's awesome. They're like, oh my God, really? That's amazing. <laughs> most males think it's weird. I think women look for things that are empowering because they, like, there's very little of that in the world these days ever, really, for women. So I think that women are kind of inspired by that. So, like, men, I think they kind of think, like, oh, you must have some sort of <laughs> some sort of anger problem or something. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, I, I, I hold a day job, too. And, like, the whole time I was worked at this company, I always told them I was a boxer. And I fought four times at the H.P. Billion at the And they, everyone came out to the fight. So it's not a secret. And everyone at work seems to, like, think it's fun and, you know, it's fine. You know, I, I never got any kind of weirdness from anybody I work with. So, I, you know, I don't really know. I think... Uh, what what about your family members, your your parents? I mean, what, what, what did they think of something like this? Uh, they... At first, they were worried. I mean, they were worried about me getting hurt. But, like, you know, I mean, I played soccer since I was eight. So I've always been very athletic and very good at sports. So, like, I think that they kind of saw it as a natural... And followed the Brazilian tradition, too. <laughs> yeah. So I think that they knew, they know how much that I enjoy playing sports and stuff. So, I, you know, I think that they were just worried that, you know, and still are worried that I'll get hurt. 
But they don't really seem to, I mean, they don't think that there's something wrong with me or that I'm weird or I like have some weird anger issues or anything. You know, I think that most people that, if, if they get to know me, then they're like, oh, okay. If I were to ask you, where did that tough mentality, that toughness come from, or, or where do you think it came from, from your childhood or, or, or wherever it might have been, you know, how would you answer that? Uh, I think it came from, you know, my parents' example. Like, both my parents, I mean, my mom um, is from a very small town in Brazil, and they were very poor, and so my mom always made sure that we, you know, just realized what we had, that we didn't waste anything, that we put our effort into the things that we thought were worth it, because you just should never take anything for granted, you know? So I think that, like, both my parents worked really hard to kind of teach us that. And my, both my parents worked really hard. I mean, I think that's something, you know, I, there's a lot of people now that, like... Pretty much that blue-collar aspect. Yeah, you know, and when your parents come from another country, you know, they, they want to make sure that they can give their... At least my parents, they wanted to make sure that they could give me, you know, a good life. So... I don't know. I just have taken that example, and I've always worked hard at the things that I do, and I really won't do it. If I don't, I'm not going to work hard at it, I just won't do it. <laughs> you, know? you talked a little bit about your amateur background there. At what point did you decide to go ahead and turn pro, you know, at, at such a early stage in your career after 20 amateur fights? Why yeah. turn pro? Was it the money? No, it's never been about money for me because um, I work also. So I don't, like, need the money that I fight for. Um, I mean, it's nice to have extra money because it's not like I'm rolling, you know, <laughs> so it's always nice to make money, but I think um, I turned pro because I kind of ran out of fights and I, I you know, I participate in, in boxing and stuff because I'm, I'm very competitive and I want to be good at it, but I just knew that, like, with my opportunities that were left in the amateurs, like, I wasn't going to get better because I couldn't find people to fight against and... No, it didn't seem worth it for me to, like, you know, it's a lot of time commitment, training all the time for something. I just felt like if there was no trade-off of, like, competing, then it wasn't worth me, like, sitting in the gym all day. Like, I, I go to the gym and do it because I, I like the competition and I feel like I can make a lot of statements and change life for lots of other, for, like, maybe younger women or something. You know, I feel like, there, like there's certain reasons that I would train all the time. But... I don't just stay in the gym all the time for for no trade off. You know what I mean? You made your pro debut in June of uh, 2008 at the Playboy Mansion in Beverly Hills. Yeah. What was that like? That transition, like when you went from amateur to becoming pro, what was it like for you? Well, um, uh, I felt pretty comfortable with it because I I don't like I've never been too afraid to get hit. You know, I feel like in, in terms of boxers, there's like a, a spectrum of people. Like some people like really hate to get hit, and some people don't mind it. I feel like I've never really been too afraid. I mean, I definitely know that there's a difference, you know, but I, the thing I found the most different, which I wasn't expecting, was how it felt when you hit somebody else. Because that was the thing that I felt was more of a big deal because you can, like, feel your hand connecting to their face a little bit more. You know, like, for me, that was, like, a little bit like, oh, my gosh, you know. I think when something was coming at me, I didn't really worry about it as much. But I felt like just so much, a little bit grittier and a little bit like scarier, you know. So when I would hit somebody and I could feel like, okay, I probably left an impact there, you know. Would you say boxing came naturally to you, or was it something that you had to uh, naturally grow into uh, as time went? It was pretty natural for me in certain aspects, in terms of like how to move my body or how to that kind of stuff or like I just I would never had a bunch of fear in the ring you know but the things that were unnatural to me were are like I'm a pretty nice person you know so I did like in the beginning I did worry about like hurting people or I guess I just like would feel bad like if I hit somebody hard or something <laughs> you know so I th think that took the thing is, like, I feel bad when I'm not in the ring, but when I get in there and it hit me, then I kind of don't feel bad about it anymore. So it, it kind of solves itself, but, you know, I, I do think that, like, it's something that I definitely thought about in the beginning. And was, I mean, what used to happen, like, early on when I first started boxing, I felt like I would never really wake up until I actually got hit. And then I'd be like, okay, this is how it is. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get you now, you know? 
the longer I've been boxing, the more I've been able to like not have to wait for that. Not have to wait till I get hit with something in order to be able to hit somebody back, you know? So that is starting to go away. And I think a lot of it is because the better I get, I'm fighting people that are better also. So like the competition factor is like already just much more amped, you know? Whereas when sometimes, I mean, I would fight like early on, you fight people that maybe aren't the best fighters in the world. And so I feel like there's a little bit of like, like not mutual respect. And a few fights in, your fifth fight, actually, you fought uh, a girl by the name of Amaris Quintana, who's from the San Diego area, who's supposed yes. to be on here in a few weeks, hopefully before her fight. You fought her, got a draw, and actually fought her again in a rematch a few fights up from that, and yeah. got another draw with her. She seemed to be a pretty uh, tough competition there for you. What was it like fighting Amaris at that time a few years ago? Um, the first fight we fought was, was very good. I mean... I've had people tell me that it was the best fight they've ever seen. And by the way, it was also in her hometown, both fights. Yes, they were both in her hometown. I've always fought in everyone's hometown because I wasn't like fighting for a promoter at all. So I've always fought in other people's hometown. And the first fight with Emily, um, it was a great fight. Um, you know, it did. It ended the draw, and I think that it was really entertaining for the fans. Uh, but the, the second fight, I really think that I kind of, I really think that I won that one. But who knows, you know, I feel like I'll all fight. As a fighter, it's my job to feel like I win, so I just feel like everyone feels that way. <laughs> you know, when you fought for that WBO title bout for the first time, what was it like knowing that you're going to be fighting for that bout, knowing that this is like a dream come true for you, this is what you've been working for forever? What was it like to get that news when you're going to fight for that bout for the first time? Uh, it was really exciting. Um, my trainer and manager, you know, we had been called to fight for the title before, but we couldn't take the fight because he, his wife was about to have a baby, and so it was right on the due date, and so we had to postpone it for a while, and I saw the look on his face, and he was like, I am so sorry, like, this is a nightmare, but I remember thinking, like, if they called once, they're going to call again. I mean, there's not that many women, <laughs> right, that you can't, like... <laughs> you know, get get a second shot. So I kind of, like, had it in my head, like, okay, you know, I'm ready for this. <laughs> and so a, a, a couple of months later, then we ended up signing for it. And um, I don't know, it was just, I was just, like, excited. I just thought, okay, all I think about when I'm about to fight is how I'm going to win. So I just kept thinking about how I was going to win. Winning that title, raising it for the first time when you were announced the new WBO World Flyweight Champion, what was that like for you personally, emotionally, at that moment? Uh, it was pretty awesome because um, it was actually a pretty big venue. And the girl that I took the titles from, I mean, she was 29 and 0. She was undefeated. She had never lost. And she'd been the champion for about five years or something. And so it was like a pretty major upset. That was Susie uh, Kentikian. Susie Kentikian, yeah. And... You know, it didn't all really sink in right away. I mean, in my head, I kept, I kept saying, you know, I knew I was going to win. <laughs> so I just kind of like, you know, to be honest, when they announced it, I didn't really know what they were saying because it was in German, and I didn't even know that I had won until I saw my trainer, like, hopping up and down in the corner, and then I said, oh, I also won. And so then, like, it was pretty awesome at that point. Like, I mean, we probably stayed in the ring, like, just taking pictures and... Hey, you're going to fight for this title uh, next month, I believe you said, November 30th? Uh, yeah. For this title? Who's it going to be? Where can we watch it? Or, I mean, is it going to be available for us to watch in the first place? Well, I don't know that yet. I don't have all the details yet. Um, so it'll be for both belts, the WIBF and the WBO, and um, it'll be in Germany. I've heard possibly Frankfurt Oder, but I'm not completely sure. That's the name of the city. <laughs> Uh, but I don't have the opponent yet, and um, I'm not sure if they're broadcasting it yet. So I'll have to get back to that. Last year, you know, women were they were yeah. finally allowed to fight in the Olympics. You know, you guys did better than the men. The men, yeah. for the first time, had no medals, whether it be gold or silver or bronze, had no medals. You guys yeah. are the ones that came home with the medals. So at that time, you know, everybody, especially me, I was thinking that female fighting was on the uprise, but I was like, all right, cool. This is where it's going to start changing. You know, things are, are going to start happening. Since then, what do you think of women's boxing? Do you think it has took a step forward? Do you think it's changed at all since the Olympics last year? How do you see women's boxing at this moment? Um, 
Yes, I do think it has changed a lot. But I don't think that the public has seen it yet. And the reason why I say that is because uh, every weekend I've been going and sparring with, like, um, you know, a lot of them are, are amateur young girls. I mean, I definitely think there's been a change since the Olympics because I see a lot of young, younger girls in boxing now. Like, when I first started boxing, I mean, I didn't start boxing until I was in my 20s. But, and that was everybody because no one's parents were putting them in boxing. No little girls were like, Mom, I want to be on the boxing team. You know, because they didn't see anyone that was boxing, so they like, you know, but when the Olympics happen, now you have, like, young girls that are watching TV and are like, oh, uh, you know, I, I want to do that. So that is pretty big deal, and unfortunately, it takes, a, like, a while, you know, once, but when those girls, I mean, a lot of them, I mean, maybe not 2016, but 2020, you know, those are the girls that are going to be vying for the Olympics. And by the time you have, like, that level of competition, like, vying for a couple spots on the Olympic team, like, you'll have, like, a lot more depth of opponents. Like, what's happening now in women's boxing is that, like, there's just not enough people. Like, at least the men, you know, when they start as out in the pros, they may have, like, 10 or 15 four-round fights or four- and six-round fights, something like that you know, to kind of build them up and people start to know who they are. But with women right now, like, there's not enough people. Like, you're fighting for a title, you know, after eight fights or something. To put it a little like, more into perspective, I mean, how hard is, let's say, like, for you personally to get sparring partners or people to work with in the gym? Oh, it's really hard. I mean, I end up sparring people that are much bigger than me. I spar, like, whoever's around. You know, I like just, there's some people that I only do defense with or there's some people that, like, or I have to line up a lot of people because, you know, what happens at my weight is, like, people become, you know, 12-year-olds are my size. I'll have to spar, like, 12 12-year-olds because they can only go, like, three minutes or something, you know? So then Yeah, I'll and like, although they give you a good training too. because uh, you're, you're fighting people, like, maybe heavier than you, but, uh, but at the same time, you want people at the same caliber as you so you can know how to fight them when you fight them at a world-class level like you're at. Right, right. So that's, it's hard to find. How did yeah. you get the nickname Mighty or Slash Poderosa? How did you get that nickname? Well, so it started out as Mighty, and that was given to me by my trainer because I just kind of kept coming all the time. And then Poderosa happened. I went and fought in Mexico for an interim title there. I fought Aureli Mussino. And at the fight, I ended up losing the decision. But in my opinion, I think I chased her around the ring for the majority. And after the fight, all the fans came up to me for hours and were like, you won that fight, you're the real champion, and you can watch it on YouTube. There's like the commentary from the commentator. He's really impressed by my boxing, <laughs> right? And so I didn't give myself the name Poderosa. They gave it to me, and it showed up on Box Direct. I don't know who put it on there, <laughs> to be honest. We didn't. I didn't put it on there. I'd never updated Box Strike from the beginning. And then once I won the title from Susie, then my trainer went and like updated all the information and just left Poderosa on there because it had been updated by I don't know someone in Mexico. What do you want to see in women's boxing by the time you're let's say fifty, sixty, seventy years old? What do you want to see in, in the change of boxing for women? What do you hope is accomplished? Well, I just want to see opportunity. Like, when I look at, like, tennis, like, tennis is a sport where, like, when people watch tennis, no one's like, oh, shit, the girls are on. I'm going to turn this off now. Nobody says that, right? People watch tennis, and they're like, the guys and the girls, they're watching both, and they have equal respect for the girls and the guys. I, and, like, there's very few women's sports that people, like, were like, well, I'm going to go watch. I'm going to watch that, you know? But the one that I feel like stands out the most to me is tennis because I feel like, the tennis organizations have done a lot to, like, really make, you know, the playing field for women and men pretty even. And there was a time when it wasn't that way. Like, there was a time when men got a lot of money for their tennis matches and women got no money, they got no prize money and stuff. But, like, they had a good organization that, like, put it all together. And I think that, like, boxing does have that ability. But I think it's just going to take a while and there has to be, like, People taking good fights, not just taking, you know, fights that are easily winnable so that, you know, people want to watch, you know. And even though you're going to be here for a hundred more years, how do you want people to remember Melissa McMurrow once it's all said and done? Well, really, I just want to set, like, a good example for people. I want to, like, 
I just want people to know that if like they really want something, they should just get out there and do it. And so I just hope to do that. I hope to inspire people to do whatever it is that they want to do. So I really hope that like that's what people will see when they see me. Well, you made me smile while I was talking to you. You make me smile every time I watch you fight. And I hope on November 30th when you fight, it'll make me smile again and make everybody smile and blow up the sport of women's boxing like only <laughs> someone like Melissa McMurrow can do. Melissa, thank you very much for coming on to theboxingbar.com. It was an honor and privilege to talk to you. And hopefully you can come back on and let us know your thoughts and feelings in the future. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much.